further ado, why don't I turn it over to you to um, uh, get things kicked off. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who don't know, I'm Tom Bonadio. I'm the founder of the Bonadio Group, and I get the opportunity to introduce some of our people that work at the Bonadio Group who are experts in estate planning. I also get the opportunity to work with some of our new partners and high probability advisors who are who is the company that, that is associated with us uh, and does investment counseling. But today you're going to be hearing from Cindy Trugowski uh, and Kathy Johnson. If it's unusual times, like we all know, um, there's always some silver lining. The silver lining here is that this might be a great time for you to update your estate planning. And there are some things that could be good advantages for you. And then our friends from High Probability will be talking to you about the markets, which have also been uh, unique in these last few months. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Cindy and Kathy. Thank you, Tom. So as Tom indicated, this is a perfect opportunity to revisit your estate plan. There's some strategies that are timely and between the markets, the estate tax laws that are in effect right now. So some of the things that we want to go over and bring your to your attention, one being Roth IRA conversions, those have always been a thing, but even more so now. Some gifting strategies, whether that's to family or to charity, and some estate freeze techniques. Perhaps you've already used your federal exclusion and um, you just want to remove future appreciation. See? So before we jump into those though, as you should do with any planning. Uh, go forward one more, yeah. Before we jump into those, there's more to it than just the techniques. When you do any planning, it's best not to do it in a vacuum. The techniques are like tools in a toolbox. You gotta figure out which tool will do the job, but then you also have to, you know, whether it's a screwdriver, et cetera, now what kind of screwdriver? And you might be talking with friends, family, neighbors, et cetera, and they might say, Oh, I did this strategy, it worked great for me. Well, first you have to step back and see if that strategy even makes sense for your situation. And then there's ways to design most of them that it can be customized for your particular finances and other situation, your goals, et cetera. So step back, consider all the other aspects before you jump in using a technique, because we can all throw those out there. So what you need to consider is your cash position, your cash flow needs, because some strategies will impact that or need, maybe you need that to provide you with some cash flow. Also your financial security. You gotta make sure you keep enough for yourself. So you don't wanna go give, you need to understand how much can you afford to gift? How much is excess capital? So you need to do that analysis first. And then you always have to understand your income tax and estate and gift tax implications for your particular situation as well as that for your heirs. These strategies, one strategy might be better than another when you put those factors into play. So even understanding your philanthropic goals, that could dictate one strategy over another or how it's designed. And if your planning involves a business, we look at it from the individual standpoint, but you also have to look at, at it from the business standpoint. This needs to work for the business's finances, both from a cash and tax perspective as well. So make sure that you're stepping back and pulling, pulling all these pieces together to come up with the right strategies that fit your situation. Steve? And Kathy, you want to go over the Roth IRA conversion? Yeah. The first planning opportunity um, I'd like to share with you today is the Roth IRA conversion. And what does that mean? Um, a Roth IRA conversion means that you're converting a pre-tax traditional IRA to a tax-free Roth IRA. So a pre-tax traditional IRA is an IRA that's funded with pre-tax money. So when you take distributions from a traditional IRA, when you retire or later on, they're taxable because you haven't paid tax on net income um, or its appreciation. Um, with a Roth IRA, you're funding it with money that you've already paid tax on. So when you take that money out later, it's tax-free. Um, you can do a full or a partial conversion. Um, so when you do the, meaning you could convert all of your traditional IRA or you could convert a portion of that IRA to a Roth. When you do the conversion, in order for it to become a Roth, you have to pay tax at that time. 
by paying the tax now, you're eliminating that burden later. Why is this a good technique right now? Um, it's a good technique right now because, as everyone knows, the market's down. Um, so most of us, when you look at your retirement funds, they're probably down. Um, but the good news is if history tells us anything, the market's going to rebound eventually. Um, but because the values are depressed right now, when you do the conversion, you're paying tax on a lesser amount. And then when that rebound happens, it's happening in your tax-free Roth IRA. Um, now is also a good timing because tax rates are lower now than they've been in the past and possibly in the future. Um, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that was enacted a couple years ago lowered the tax rates. And also this year, you know, due to the coronavirus and the economic situation that we're currently in, your income may be lower than normal. You know, if you're a business owner, certainly your business income may be down because you haven't been able to be fully open for the last couple months. Or even if you're an employee, you know, if, you, if your income is based on sales or anything like that, your income may be down as well. So you may be in a lower income tax bracket this year than you would normally find yourself. Steve? Who does a Roth IRA conversion make sense for? Um, for a younger person, a uh, conversion may make sense. Um, one, their income is probably lower and thus their tax rates are probably lower than they will be in the future, you know, assuming their earnings are going to increase over the years. And also younger people have the benefit of time. You know, having the benefit of time means the income in that IRA is accruing over the years. Um, so a Roth IRA is usually a good idea for a younger person. A Roth IRA conversion is also a good idea for people that have excess wealth. Um, people with excess wealth, a Roth IRA, if you don't need the income from it, can be a very effective vehicle to pass to your heirs. Um, one of the reasons is that a Roth IRA, unlike other traditional IRAs, don't require minimum distributions over your lifetime. So if you don't need this money, again, you're allowing it to sit in that Roth IRA and compound. If you leave your Roth IRA to your heirs, another benefit is that those distributions will come out to your heirs tax-free. Um, this is especially valuable given the recent SECURE Act, which now requires that inherited IRAs be paid out over a 10-year period. Another benefit, if you have excess wealth, is that you're paying the tax now on those funds. So it's almost an, another gift you're making to your heirs by paying it tax now, and there's no gift tax implication to it. Steve? So all of this, the pandemic, the deflated values, the low interest rates, we have perfect gifting conditions. So you add that to the fact that we have a high federal estate exclusion, so it's 11.58 million each, um, no New York gift tax, uh, you have to check your own state rules, but for New York, there's no New York gift tax. You have to live three years for that asset to be effectively removed from your estate. And right now, we have a full arsenal of techniques still available. Over the years, they keep throwing out the idea of either eliminating or reducing the effectiveness of some of the strategies and techniques that we have, but they haven't done that yet. It, keep, it keeps getting sidelined. So you know, think of the federal budget deficit, who knows? They might cut back on a lot of those things and really restrict it. So right now we have them. Same with valuation discounts. They've also talked about restricting those and they haven't yet. So we still have those in full force. So even, especially those that own a business and maybe your succession planning goals are to gift the business to family member. Um, you've, you know, you've done an analysis to make sure you can afford to do the gifting or maybe you want to sell it for a low interest rate uh, note and you can afford to do that, now might be a perfect time for a business owner to implement their succession planning. So it's a perfect mix creating all these opportunities for those that are in the position to do so. Next. So right now, one of the things is that we have enhanced gifted leverage. So perfect time to take advantage of that. So I referenced that the federal exclusion is 11.58 million per person. So if you have a federal taxable estate, it's 
now's the opportunity to lock in that exclusion. It's set to sunset 1231.25. So this was put in a couple, a few years ago at the tax law change. But without any act of Congress, no bills, no laws, it's going to sunset. So, and no political fallout. But you think about all the federal spending that's going on, and you look at the fact that we have two presidential elections in the meantime, much can change. So there's a very high chance that that exclusion can drop back down to some level. I know Bernie Sanders is out of the presidential race, but at some point he was recommending three and a half million, going back to our, what was it, 2009 level. So there's that risk that we won't have it for very much longer. So opportune time to lock that in while, you, while we have it. And the fact that um, values are deflated right now, you can transfer more units for the same gift value and let that rebound happen in the hands of your heirs instead of in your own estate compounding it. Now for those that don't have a federal, uh, that don't have a federal tax, taxable estate but maybe have a state taxable estate, it's a similar idea that maybe they had a certain gift they wanted to make but they can now do it at a lower value and preserve more of their federal exclusion to use for future gifts or for their own estate. So the New York exclusion right now is 5.85 million. So a married couple can shelter, for federal it's the 11.58, married couple can shelter with 23 million. For New York it's 11 or 5.85 million. So you can shelter over 11 million dollars as a married couple. And a lot of people might think, okay, so if my assets are under that, I don't have an estate, estate tax problem. But it all depends on how those assets are structured, who beneficiary designations are, who the owners are, and how your estate planning documents are structured. It could be that you only have one of those exemption amounts between the two of you. You have to share it between the two of you, and that you still have a state taxable estate when you don't realize it. And also, if your estate is over more than 105% of that um, 5.85 million, it, it goes to zero. So it's fully phased out. So that's huge. So you have to, maybe it's an opportunity to do some gifting and reduce your state taxable estate so that you preserve that exclusion that you have. So again, New York doesn't have a gift tax. You just have to live three years from the date of the gift. So possibly I also compound this with saving state estate taxes by uh, doing these gifts now. Next. When you're gifting, you also have to consider some income tax implications. Um, with the higher estate exclusion that Cindy was just talking about, the income tax planning side of estate planning is more important now than ever. Um, one of the things that you need to consider is um, the concept of basis. So basis normally is what you paid for something. So when you buy a stock at $10 and it appreciates to $8 or $18, you have a gain of $8. Um, if you gift to your heirs, um, if you do a current gift, your heirs get a carryover basis. So again, if your basis was 10, they get your 10. Um, however, if you die and your heirs inherit that same stock, they get what's called a step up in basis. A step up in basis is the fair market value of that same stock at the date of your death. So if you think about you know, some of the Silicon Valley stocks or any stock that's significantly appreciated, um, you need to think about, is it best to gift it now or is it best to wait? Um, so when you're gifting, you need to weigh the estate tax savings that you're going to get, which right now the estate tax is at 40% against the capital gains tax implication to your heirs. When you're gifting, you should consult your, your tax and investment advisors for advice to see which gifts make sense. Um, for instance, if you're gifting to a charity, you may want to gift um, lower asset stocks. Um, I've seen this a lot with my clients that, you know, they'll gift a lower um, basis stock to a charity because they get that fair market value as their deduction, and they've avoided paying the gain on the appreciation. However, if you're gifting to family, again, you may want to consider keeping those low basis assets in your estate so that your heirs can benefit from this step up in basis. Next. 
Cindy? Uh -oh. Can gift outright, certainly that's the simplest way. Um, you can gift it right directly to your heirs and let them do whatever they want with it. And you get to enjoy seeing what they do with it. So that's a nice benefit of lifetime gifts. Or you can gift in trust. And there's lots of reasons, tax and non-tax reasons, to make gifts in trust for your heirs. It could, a big one is asset protection. So you think of divorces, lawsuits. I think we're in a lawsuit happy world. So that's a nice benefit. Or you don't want your child to get the money at a too early an age. You want to stagger it out. You might want to do different ages spread out. You might want to keep an interest for lifetime for different reasons. Maybe you want to benefit your spouse for lifetime, but know that the assets ultimately pass to children you have from a prior marriage. So lots of reasons to gift and trust. So um, you have options available, Steve. So one of those trusts that we're, we, I want to talk about is what we call a zeroed out grantor retained annuity trust, a grant. So if you make a gift to this kind of trust, the way it works is the trust pays you back an annual annuity payment. And we would it can be designed to be high enough, basically be all the principal plus some interest, so that there is no remainder calculated to be passing to heirs for gift tax purposes. So it zeroes out the gift tax implications. You don't use any of your exclusions fully intact. And at the end of the trust term, any assets remaining in the trust pass to your heirs. So when we look at the current interest rate environment we're in, the way that calculation all works is based on the interest rates that the IRS puts out. So it's 0.6% for June when we calculate what the gift value is. So your, your uh, return, appreciation, everything, your performance, let's say, on the assets in the side of the trust have to exceed 0.6%. So I think over time, that should be doable. So anything, any growth beyond that interest rate passes to heirs free of any trans, transfer tax. The fact that we have deflated values in these low interest rates increases the likelihood that that appreciation will be passing on to heirs tax-free. And also the deflated values reduce the gift calculation um, of the gift tax impact of how much is being passed into this trust. Because the payments come right back to, out to you, what you put in, you get back out, it's called an estate freeze technique when we zero it out like this. So what you're doing is removing future appreciation, which can be powerful. So this is, works very well if you've already gifted enough to use your federal exclusion, because this would just remove future growth and keep your estate from compounding further. Now the key is to coordinate with your investment advisor on what assets to put into this chest, maybe what ones would have the greatest chance of rebounding, and which ones maybe have the potential for the highest growth, and then certainly on an ongoing basis, ongoing basis with the investment strategy. Next. Now the other one, another trust that's perfect for this environment is what we call a charitable lead annuity trust, a CLAT. It works similar to the prior trust I just talked about, the GRAT. It, except that instead of the payments coming to you, they go to charity. So you make a gift to the trust, the trust pays charity an annual payment, and at the end of the term, the assets pass to your heirs. Now maybe you're already making annual charitable gifts. So what this, the opportunity with this is you're leveraging those annual gifts you're already making to pass wealth to heirs at a gift tax discount. And the reason there's a discount is the, kids, the heirs aren't getting it right away. They have to wait. They have to wait to the end of the term of the trust. So whether you set it up for 10 years, whatever you set it up for, they have to wait. So now there's a discounted impact to them for the gift tax calculation for what's going into the trust. Now the fact that we have deflated values that reduces that gift tax impact, and the low interest rate can mean more the heirs get uh, more wealth passes to the heirs gift tax free, similar to with the the grant that we just talked about. Now there's another benefit with this trust in the current tax environment. Under the 2017 tax law change, a lot of people now are not itemizing. The standard deduction was significantly increased. 
So if you made charitable contributions, if it wasn't enough to get you over that hurdle of the standard deduction, you didn't get an added tax benefit for making that charitable contribution. So with this strategy, you're funding the trust with assets that are in your portfolio. And you're carving those interests and dividends and capital gains off your personal tax return and putting them in this trust. So now that, that income is shifted over into this trust. But now this trust is getting a charitable deduction for the payments it makes to charity every year. And that can be, again, you gotta design it and structure it and coordinate with the, your investment advisor on the investment income that's coming into this trust. But it could be that the charitable payment offsets that income and you weren't getting that on your personal return. So you're getting a tax savings by carving those, that investment income off your tax return. So, um, and again, uh, you, Coordinate with your investment advisor both on the funding assets of the trust and then the ongoing investment strategy and the income in coordination with the annual charity payment. Next. Another estate freeze technique that works particularly well right now is the sale to an intentionally defective grantor trust. Um, what is an, an intentionally defective grantor trust? Um, it's effective for estate tax purposes, so don't think negatively about the word defective. Um, it's removing those assets that you put into the trust from your estate. However, for income tax purposes, it's intentionally drafted the trust agreement um, so that it's not effective for income tax purposes, meaning that the grantor um, still has those assets, the income from the trust um, and would pay the tax on that. Um, this technique is rather than making a, a full gift to a trust, you're selling some of your assets to the trust and you're taking a note back. So this um, technique works well for people that are maybe looking for some cash flow still, um, and they may need that cash flow to partially pay the taxes on the income that's occurring in the trust. Um, right now is an ideal time, again, because low values are reducing the gift tax portion. Um, in order for this trust to work for IRS purposes, the trust has to have some liquid assets in it. So usually there's um, seed money, they call it, that you put in at, a, uh, at least 10% of what the sale is going to be. So that because the value is low, the portion that you have to put in as a gift before the transaction is, is low as well. Right now, low interest rates make this an ideal um, technique. The long-term interest rate right now um, is approximately 1%. So this is the second requirement to make this work by the IRS, that you have to have um, at least a market rate interest on this loan. But at 1%, you know, it, it, it's very low. So that means that the interest coming back to you is less. So that's less interest coming back to you and assets that would go into your estate. And there's more of the trust left to compound. Um, this is, a, as I said, an estate freeze technique. Um, and normally, uh, the primary benefit of using this technique is the appreciation that happens. Um, usually, you'll see this maybe with a business or stocks that will be um, increasing in value. So if that asset that you're putting into this trust is increasing at a rate greater than the 1% on the note, you've moved all that appreciation out of your estate and into this trust. Next. We've covered a number of uh, techniques today. Um, and one thing I wanted to share with you is that the best approach when you're doing estate planning is a team approach. Um, I would encourage you to not only contact your tax advisor, but also your financial advisor. And of course, you're gonna need um, a good attorney that can draft the documents appropriately. And the most effective estate planning is when there's a collaborative effort between these professionals. Next. Um, as Cindy pointed out, now is a prime time. If you have a taxable estate, I urge you to talk to your advisors now um, the, uh, between the law, you know, it's likely there's a lot of uncertainty right now, um, but we do know that that exclusion is at an all-time high and it's likely not to remain there. Um, so 
you know, we, we know what it is now. We know that these techniques are still in place. Um, so please, you know, contact your advisors if you have a taxable estate or if any of this um, sounds interesting to you, please feel free to contact us. Um, and now I'm going to turn things over to Steve Carl and his team at um, High Probability Advisors, and they're going to talk to you about some economic and market updates. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Cindy. Really appreciate what you guys went over, and you'll see that we're very excited to have it passed over to us because we work with them on a lot of clients, and it is really great when they set a team approach what we can do together. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons we wanted to do this. Um, for a lot of the people on the call, we work with directly. There's some other people, a, a fair amount that we might be a new name to. Um, so just a quick background on who we are. High Probability Advisors, we're an investment advisory firm, and we think we're very unique because of the experience and innovation that we put to work. Uh, from the experience side, the average tenure of our, of our uh, executive team is 30 years, 30 plus years in the industry. And each of us has come from running a multi-billion dollar firm. So that experience, it was super helpful, but we also shared a vision. We also kind of, each of us saw kind of the evolution taking place in the investment industry and wanted to get ahead of that. And that's where the innovation side comes in. What we're focused on is just evidence-based, academically proven strategies and trying to keep the low cost and optimizing that tax management. And that's what you see on the, on the screen, our, our mission, that academically proven strategy is what we focus on. Just everything we can do to give our clients the highest probability of success, that's what we're focused on. You won't see us kind of dabble in the kind of emotional base, kind of coin flip type uh, processes that unfortunately we see out there far too often. But that's who we are. And today we're going to cover a few things. And, you know, in the context we said with the COVID outbreak, the social distancing, there's a lot going on. Um, where do we go from here? So I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Jeff Coons. And, and Jeff, in addition to having run a $50 billion investment firm before uh, joining us, Jeff is a PhD in economics and his real passion is the economy and markets. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jeff. Thanks very much, Steve, and good afternoon, everyone. If you're like me, then you spend an inordinate amount of time over the last few weeks reading articles, listening to experts, trying to understand the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and the social distancing being used to combat it. But that swirl of facts and opinions around us, it's hard to, it's easy to get overwhelmed. So to make good decisions, we need to have a framework for bringing new information in and adapting our path accordingly. I'm going to offer such a framework for looking at the economy and also looking at the financial markets. And then our Chief Investment Officer, Mike Jones, will provide an investment framework for a higher probability of achieving your goals and objectives. So let's start with the economy. Go one more, Steve. So our framework starts with taking the information that we need to make good decisions and baking, uh, putting it into three buckets. Number one, information that we know. Number two, information that we don't know, but others do. And then number three, information that's unknowable today. When it comes to the economy, and particularly the shape of the economic recovery, will it be a V, a W, or a Nike swoosh? Um, having looked at the information, it's pretty clear that there's very little left in the second bucket. Information that I don't know, and you don't know, but other, peop other people do. Instead, a lot of what's coming in as new information is really nothing more than guesswork about what's in the third bucket, um, which is um, things that are unknowable. So what do we know today? If we go to the next slide, first thing that we know is this equation, C plus I plus G plus X. C is consumer spending, I is investment spending, G is government spending, and together with net exports, they represent the total economic activity of a nation. If there's anything that you remember from your Economics 101 class, this should be it. It's the framework that I use to help um, evaluate arguments that people make about the direction of the economy. I break that argument down to these components to validate them. When we think about the first component, consumer spending, which was about 70% of the US economy prior to the pandemic, um, we have to keep in mind that consumers spend income and income requires jobs. So any case about the timing or path of the recovery needs to address 
how lost jobs will be returned. The second component, investment spending, is driven largely by CEO and CFO competence. If business executives believe that production or that demand for their products will overwhelm their productive capacity, then they're going to spend the money to invest to expand that capacity. So keeping an eye on business sentiment is uh, very helpful um, for uh, investment spending monitoring. And this brings us to G, and it brings us to the second thing that we know today. We know that the federal government is aggressively working to push back on this economic downturn. Fiscal policy steps include, um, you know, extending and uh, expanding the uh, unemployment benefits that have been um, uh, available for people today, um, providing business loans, some of which are forgivable, and then outright checks to consumers. Now we know, but then the other thing is monetary policy, and the Federal Reserve has lowered interest rates, injected liquidity directly into the financial system, and then backed mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, corporate bonds, and the trading in uh, municipal bonds as well. Now we know that these steps are not enough to keep us from having a recession over the near term, but what we don't know is whether these steps will be effective over time. And this gets to what is unknowable today. We can't know the timing of this recovery because it's based on the path of a disease and it's based on decisions that have not yet been made. And I'm not just talking about decisions by governors to open up their states. I'm also talking about decisions by individual consumers and businesses for when they believe it's safe to return and the uh, um, steps that they're gonna take um, to avoid a resurgence of the disease um, once they return. Likewise, we don't know the structural issues that are going to occur in the economy between now and then. In particular, our business is gonna be able to um, push off um, debt and uh, go to, uh, you know, be able to rehire and uh, reinvest again. Likewise, we don't know how consumer behavior will change over the long term. Will we ever be willing to stand in line for a crowded restaurant again, much less in line for a uh, um, Black Friday sale again? We simply don't know these answers. So rather than trying to uh, make decisions around the timing and shape of the recovery, which is based on um, the unknowable and guesswork on the unknowable, it's better to make decisions based on what you know today, and then make sure that those decisions are flexible enough to adapt to changes in information that come in and try to filter that information through the framework that we've just discussed. Another thing to keep in mind is that information that comes in is not gonna come in in a straight line. Often in recoveries, it's two steps forward and one step back, but stay focused on the trend, try to shut out the noise and uh, you'll be able to make better decisions. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about if we go to the next slide, um, is the market and the slide after that shows a table that has a list of different stock and bond market indexes and then the first column of numbers shows the returns of those indexes from the peak in the u.s stock market in february to its trough on march 23rd and then the second column shows um, those uh, returns um, for what you're likely to see in your may performance statements so the year-to-date returns through may there are two points I'd like to make about the markets. And the first one relates to the performance of um, the managers and funds that you may have. The difference in performance between different managers and different funds is gonna be driven more by those managers' basic investment strategies and styles than any amount of skill measured in any way. And as a result, um, this time period is not a litmus test for the quality of your manager similar to any time period that is kind of a single narrow time period. To make this point clearer, um, take a look at the fourth line here, with, which is the Russell 1000 growth index. If you look at the last number in that row, US large cap growth stocks are up 5% year to date through May. The line above that though shows that value stocks, large cap value stocks are still down over 15%. And the line above that shows that small cap stocks are still down over 20%. What this means is that if you have managers who are um, have a valuation discipline or are willing to own smaller companies, they're gonna look high risk. While at the same time, don't be surprised 
If your manager whose process has them loaded up with a boatload of large cap tech stocks comes into the next meeting with you, um, you know, uh, declaring victory and declaring themselves as a low risk manager. As Mike Jones's recent article, The Elephants in the Room points out, nothing can be further from the truth today, particularly when you get um, such an extreme as we have today in uh, the performance among these different areas. This um, uh, is the first step point that I wanted to make. The second point that I wanted to make is that um, we need to be very careful about using the term unprecedented when describing these types of environments as an investor. If you look at that first column of numbers, you see that when the global pandemic was unchecked, the markets processed that information and their judgment was swift and severe. But if we look at the next slide, what you see is that um, this was not an unprecedented market event. We have had downturns just as swift and far more severe than what we have seen um, in this market. I know that this feels like a very unusual and unique environment. The reality is every bear market is unique, yet bear markets are part of being a long-term investor and they're part of that history that leads us to want to be an equity investor with better returns over time. If we have the right allocation, if we stick to our strategy, we can achieve long-term success, um, you know, despite the fact that bear markets are just simply a part of being a long-term investor. And to talk more about investment strategy, I'd like to introduce Mike Jones. Mike has over 40 years of investment experience. Um, that includes being at the cutting edge of uh, different trends in the investment industry. Uh, he helped found a fundamental stock picking firm back in the mid 80s. He helped found a uh, passive um, allocation firm back in the 90s. And then today he's founding a factor-based investment firm with high probability advisors. He's um, been uh, an investor through some of the most difficult market environments that I showed in that last chart. And so um, I know that his insights um, you're going to find uh, very useful and, and helpful. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> like to get started by going to the next slide and uh, talking a little bit about uh, stocks. Uh, I hear people say stocks are volatile. And yet, if you think about what a stock is, it's a piece of paper that signifies a percentage ownership in a business. It has no, it's not animated. It can't be volatile. But what is volatile are people's behaviors. So people trade stocks and the trading of stocks back and forth is what adds the volatility to that to the whole investment process. And it's not true not only of stocks, but also of bonds and real estate and any other investment. People's behaviors shape prices and those and those behaviors need to be understood. So at High Probability Advisors, we spent a, spent a lot of time thinking about the behavioral concepts, the biases that drive uh, investment behaviors. In a downturn like we just went through, uh, there's, a, there's a handful of, of things that are, are significant and can lead to uh, adverse uh, activity. Uh, I've listed three of them here. You see recency being one. This is a, the, a term that, uh, that identifies that we believe that recent events, things that are happening right now, are more important or more severe in some, some phase or another relative to past events. I'll give you a good example of what this is. In, in 9-11, when the Twin Towers came down, I was on the phone with my, my mother that, that evening. And she said to me, she was very distraught, said to me, this is the worst thing that's happened in my lifetime. And I said, Mom, you were alive and a teenager when uh, Pearl Harbor happened. And Pearl Harbor had a much higher uh, uh, adverse uh, impact than uh, anything that happened today. And she said, well, yeah, you're probably right, but this, this just feels worse. And she was right. It feels worse because it's right now. We know how Pearl Harbor worked out. We know what happened in World War II. What we don't know is how the, how the Twin Towers, when they, that night when they came down, what our world was going to be like in the subsequent years. Now that we know what that is, it seems less severe to us. And the same thing will happen with the COVID pandemic that we're in right now. Um, so recency is important. You've got to recognize that there's context for almost everything that happens to us, precedents that we can look at to help us guide our behaviors. But we don't want to believe that what's happening right now 
is somehow way more severe than anything that's happened in the past. The second thing here is hurting when uh, this happens when you see a lot of headlines activity, uh, both good and bad, people get herded into doing the same thing that other people are doing as opposed to things doing the things that would be suggested by independent analysis. And we have to avoid that at all costs. The last thing here is loss aversion. This is a very well-known uh, human behavioral con uh, construct. And that is that people are about twice as sensitive to losing a dollar as they are to making a dollar. And uh, this, is, uh, this leads to a lot of uh, behaviors in, during periods like the uh, March of this year when the market was down dramatically. Uh, people see the losses and they run. They try to get out of the way because they just, they just are so uh, severely impacted by that momentary uh, uh, impact of the loss that they forget about their long-term plan. So these behavioral concepts are things that we, we try to understand, communicate to our clients, and make sure that we're not reacting in an adverse way because if we do, adverse reactions lead to some problems. Let's take a look at the next slide. <clears throat> Here you can see that the returns for a 30-year period from 1990 through, through 2018, uh, a very long time and with reasonably good stock market returns, as you'll see in the first bar, the tallest bar there, a 9.29% compound annual rate of return over that period of time. But the other bars represent that if you missed just the one best trading day or the five best trading days or the 15 best trading days, you see what happens to your wealth over that period of time. The compound annual rates of return are significantly impacted in such a way that, that it's a really uh, – dramatic. So getting scared out of a stock market decline like, like March of uh, 2020 uh, makes you uh, prone to missing some of the best returns uh, days that there are out there. And indeed, some of the worst return days that we saw in March were followed within a day or two by some of the best return days that we saw. So if you're out, if, you're out of, if you were out of the market since, say, call it mid-March, you're now looking at a stock market that has gone up and is higher than it was in mid-March. And if you're out, now you're wondering, what should I do now? Uh, so anyway, uh, this is a good example of, this recent period is a good example of trying to stay with a long-term plan and not react to short-term stimulus uh, on a behavioral basis. Next slide, please. This is a, a very good chart uh, that was uh, developed by Jeff Koons in a, in a piece that he did in, in mid-March uh, called uh, No Time Like the Present. Uh, he noted that, uh, that the, the five-year annualized returns, the serial five-year annualized returns of stocks, looking at each month and rolling them forward five years, looking at the returns that were earned, are in the blue uh, chart bar there, and you'll see that the median return from 1940 to 20. Uh, through the end of 2019, uh, the median return was 12% compound annual uh, for, a five, for the five-year annualized period. The worst five percentile was a, zero, a negative 0.9% return. But if you truncate that data and look only after market, stock markets have gone down by 25%, then what is the, the subsequent five-year annualized returns? And you'll see that... Uh, you have a very significant move in the data. The worst uh, outcome, the, five, the, the fifth percentile worst outcome is a plus 6.9%. And more importantly, the median outcome is plus 15.3% compound annual. So the median return shifts up pretty dramatically by 3.3%, which is huge over a very long period of time. So uh, the best time to put money to work is after a stock market decline. And if you had money, it, it, and if you had money on the sidelines, it was a great time to put it to work, even though it might have been terrifying. If you had money in the market and suffered the decline, taking the money out and not not being invested in after a 25% decline, as you can see, is a very bad financial strategy. So where does that leave us? Let's go to the next slide. First, we believe stock prices reflect mo what is known today. The stock market is. Uh, composed of huge numbers of people, very smart people that are, that are taking all the known information, computing them into what their expectations are 
uh, for various business uh, future outcomes and putting those into stock prices. The market is very efficient in general. But as Jeff mentioned, there's a lot that we don't know. So when new information comes along, it, it impacts stock, part, stock prices. Trying to guess what that new information is going to be is very difficult. As a matter of fact, it's probably impossible. So therefore, trying to do market timing, uh, getting in and out of the market based on your guesses of the future is not a very sound strategy. We believe in being in the market. We believe in, in being steady and, and allocated along lines that make sense for our individual clients and not trying to waver from that over time. The second bullet says that there's no all clear signal. I, had, I hear people say that, you know, I'm just gonna wait until things settle down a little bit. Well, they never settle down entirely, except in retrospect. The, uh, if you wait for an all clear signal, the market is going to pass you by. A great example of that is the last two months. If you got out in March or you sat on the sidelines since March and you were waiting for the all clear signal, well, didn't come. But the stock market is up pretty dramatically. So is the corporate bond market and so is the municipal bond market. All, of, all those markets that got hit pretty bad during the pandemic de uh, decline have rebounded, even though the economic data is very poor. Uh, record unemployment, uh, the quarterly earnings are coming in uh, with the impacts that you would expect from the reduced demand and GDP is, uh, numbers are going to be abysmal. So there's certainly no all clear signal out there and, and there never will be. The market is always looking at a mix of possible good news and possible bad news. And so uh, that's why we uh, adopt the stances that we do. Staying the course with, with your asset allocation and with your investment game plan is extremely important. And you hear people say this a lot, it's not just a good sound bite though. There are other things, there are things to be taken into consideration as you're along that course. And so I'll turn it over to Steve and let him tell you about that. Great. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, just I, I know we're, we're going a little long, but I, let me just highlight some of these things because we wanted to share with you what are some of the big things that we're seeing with clients and working on with clients right now and what we'd recommend. And it really dovetails with what Cindy and Kathy and their whole team do. We work a lot with them. And if you really, if you review your state plan, your financial plan, like they're saying, there's so many strategies and it's helpful too when you're coordinating with the investment manager at the same time, because we can work together to make sure we're optimizing that. So it's a, like they said, it's a great time to do that. Also rebalancing to those long-term target allocations and taking advantage of those tax loss harvesting. As Mike mentioned, some of the, the behavioral finance stuff that we're very cognizant of. March, we were at high probability, we rebalanced all of our clients' accounts. It was a scary thing to do. You don't know when you're in the midst of it. We're very glad looking back we did that because we're trying to stay with evidence-based uh, strategies. So that's, you know, taking the emotion out and staying focused on that. There's still time to do that. Really highly, highly recommend people do that. The other thing is people have cash on the sidelines and they've had opportunities or some liquidity events that have happened and now you have some cash to deploy. There's still that opportunity to use that more favorable risk-reward trade-off and, and get back and, and take advantage of that in the market. The other thing is because you are seeing a rebound, and so it's nice to say take advantage of that market rebound and review your objectives, your time horizons, and especially your cash reserve needs. And I know Cindy and Kathy talked about understanding your cash flows as well. And we're seeing that because when people, when in the midst of the of the of the impact of of COVID-19 uh, uh, impact in, in in March, it was a hard time to make decisions. It's more an emotional time to make decisions, and it's hard to do that then. But there's been a little rebound. Take a chance now, take an opportunity now, review your objectives, your time horizons, and it's particularly your cash needs. What, what do you need in, in different times, different crisis situations? It's an opportune time to do that. And then the last thing, because we've seen this a few times, especially when people were starting to say, geez, I might have to draw cash out of my accounts, there's uh, make sure that, that the allocations you have that are to less liquid assets, really assess those, think about those. Be cognizant of them because we've seen that, and it's not just hedge funds or private equity funds which have limited openings, so you might only be able to get in and out of them, you know, quarterly or maybe less often. Um, there's other ones that are sort of hidden in some regard. We've had a few clients that came over from other managers that had a big allocation to uh, closed-end bond funds, and those those assets, even in the best of times, trade sort of lightly, and 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 
and uh, more difficult times, they were almost impossible to trade and they would trade at very big discounts. So if, if you needed cash from that asset, you were going to have a problem. So those are things that now really start thinking about those things. Are, do you, are, there, are there illiquid assets that you have in your portfolio? They might have a place if you don't mind, you don't have the liquidity, uh, but now's a good time to think about those. So those are some of the things we're working on with clients and we're seeing a lot of opportunity to do stuff with. Um, with that, I've already seen that we've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'll shoot some of the questions to the panelists. First couple, Cindy and Kathy are really directed to you guys. Uh, one was, could you cover some of the things like the, for the state of Pennsylvania, if you have that knowledge, um, for, um, he said, covering the tax implications that are in Pennsylvania with regard to gifting and, and the estate amounts that they would need to take advantage. So I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but if, if you guys uh, can answer that on, on uh, Pennsylvania, that would be great. I haven't checked recently, but um, the last I remember was the estate exemption for Pennsylvania was only a million dollars, which is what New York used to be a few, quite a few years ago. So any excess over a million dollars per person, and it didn't have portability, meaning each person has their own estate exemption, and that's it. So huge impact for um, easy to run into a Pennsylvania estate tax problem with that in mind. I know there's a couple other states that only have a million dollar estate exemption. So, okay. good chance to reduce it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, this one's probably for Mike and Jeff. Um, kind of with the with this terrible economic news, high unemployment, social unrest, how is the stock market going up? Mike, you might, Mike, you might be on mute there if you're talking. So the stock market almost always begins to rebound dramatically well before the economic data turns positive. So uh, it's anticipation of the uh, turn in economic data that, dr that is driving stocks. Um, the people that are, uh, that are looking at the economy and the stock market every day know full well that the economic news is bad. But when they look at some of the, the improvements that we've, uh, potential improvements that might come from the medical advances, vaccines, and, and uh, therapeutics, uh, as well as uh, the beginning of the opening of the economies, stocks have been anticipating that return to some level of normalcy ever since the end of March. So uh, that's what's happening. People are thinking about what happens long-term to the economy and not worrying about what's happening right now. And that's almost always the case. Right, and, and so to echo what Mike said, the uh, stock market is based on the fundamentals of the underlying businesses. And they're the long-term fundamentals, not just the recent news. So you get these short-term headlines that are extreme, and you think that the market should be responding exactly in that way. But the reality is you're looking at those fundamentals over time. And it's that long-term fundamental cash flow generation capability of the businesses that really drives that value, as Mike said. Um, that's where the focus is, and that's why you get that anticipation um, as uh, conditions improve. Okay, great. Um, another one for uh, Cindy and Kathy. What is the lowest amount of assets does a family need to, to have to open a trust, including property? That, it, it, um, it can still be worthwhile for even just a few hundred thousand dollars, 300,000, 500,000, depends on the situation. I mean, granted, you have legal fees to draft a trust agreement. It could be, though, that it's formed in your estate, in your will, or your living trust, your local yeah. trust. So it would depend on your estate, but it can be still effective for just a few hundred thousand dollars. Certainly anything more than that would, would definitely be effective. So you just have to review your situation to see if it makes sense for the type of trust that you're, you're trying to form. Great, thanks, Andy. And I'll remind all the participants, um, those questions are coming in. Keep them coming in. If you remember, there's a chat box at the bottom. So we've got a few more questions, but please keep them coming if you have any, any uh, issues you want us to cover. Um, for, for Mike and Jeff, uh, what you mentioned rebalancing. What is, the best what is the best method to rebalance? And also, is it too late to rebalance? Well, I, I think that once you set, set an asset allocation that makes sense for your portfolio, let's say for the sake of arguments, 60% in stocks, 50% in, in fixed income. Uh, once you set that, if 
the those if your portfolio actual investment mix gets 10 plus or minus 10 percent outside of those that range it's time to think about rebalancing um, it's usually easiest to rebalance just annually uh, by taking a if you're taking a draw from a portfolio or things like that that's the easy way to do it but in a period like march when the when the stock market went down and if you your bond your bonds didn't go down nearly as much that would be a time that you would be moving money out of bonds and in, into uh, stocks because of that 10 because of breaching that 10 percent plus or minus differential um, is it too late to do it now is a, is a good question the market's rebounded so much i mean i'm very pleased that we got ours done in march because it takes that uh, out of the equation, but if you're outside of, if you have did not rebalance and your asset allocation is plus or minus 10%, uh, more than 10% uh, away from your targets, then yes, I would say it's certainly still a good time to rebalance. Uh, and the markets still are down broadly, so it's not a bad, not a bad time to get after that. Great. Um, one other uh, question it looks like for Cindy or Kathy, are do there, I, do you, um, I'm sorry, are there any income limits that you apply to a Roth IRA conversion? Um, the, right now, there are not income limits for a Roth IRA conversion. Um, years back, like in 2010, I believe was the last year that income limits applied. So anyone that has a traditional IRA, a 401k, or um, any traditional plan um, is eligible for a Roth IRA conversion. Okay, great, thank you. We've got one more question. Um, uh, Mike and Jeff, I'm gonna throw it to you. Uh, they own New York State, New York City muni bonds yield at uh, greater than 4% uh, tax-free. The portfolio is 55% equity, 35% fixed in muni and 10% cash. Would you buy, sell, or hold these munis? Jeff, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So uh, this is actually a, a topic that uh, has been a live conversation. Um, you know, the the uh, impact of uh, credit quality that is likely to deteriorate generally for uh, um, state and local governments as a result of the uh, the, the back end of the uh, um, the recovery. Um, the pandemic. Um, our conclusion is that generally, you, you know, if you're diversified, if you have a portfolio that is focused on general obligations, so obligations that um, um, hit the broad taxing power of the entity, um, then um, maintaining municipal bond exposure makes a lot of sense. But you should keep an eye on credit quality. Um, you should keep an eye on the source if you have a revenue bond, which means they're funded by a specific revenue from a specific project or a specific location, um, just keep an eye on uh, whether you know those that revenue is going to uh, um, create problems or not. Um, but generally, um, as uh, uh, Cindy and Kathy talked about, um, tax rates are at lows. Um, there, there is a uh, reasonable likelihood that. Um, we're seeing the lows in tax rates now. And so municipal bonds are going to be of, of value in the future, um, uh, you know, for that, the tax-free aspects of it. But, but you do need to make sure that you have a good quality portfolio. And Mike, do you want to add, add anything to that? Yeah, I'd just say that in March, when the pandemic was uh, hitting New York City and New York State <clears throat> pretty hard, uh, New York muni bonds uh, got hit pretty hard. Uh, and that's why the yields are so much higher than, than uh, you might expect in an environment where the 10-year treasury yields less than a percent. Uh, that won't be the case forever, that, that there was some fear-driven selling. I think that slowly that market has been healing itself. Uh, I listened to a, a, a very thoughtful and long uh, conference on, on, new, on muni bonds in, in general, but also spent a long time on New York State. Talking about the tax, or the credit worthiness, and New York State is still investment grade. It's not the worst uh, state out there by any means. The, as Jeff mentioned, GO bonds should be just fine, and I would be focused on those. Revenue bonds a little more problematic. Some things that we never expected to be problematic, like healthcare bonds, are, are 
a problem now. So um, I would say that the New York State um, municipal bonds are, are very attractive and, and for all the reasons that Jeff mentioned. Uh, and, but because they do trade as, as in a risk category that is, that is a higher risk category than treasuries, you might want to uh, alter uh, for just for risk management purposes, alter your mix of bonds to include U.S. Treasuries for part of it. Great. Well, we're past the three o'clock time, and I don't see any more questions lined up for us, but uh, we, we really appreciate it. And just to remind everybody, we will have this session recorded. We'll get the slides and a couple of the articles that were, were cited, so we'll put that out in a package in the next day or two. And just know that, um, you know, Kathy and Cindy and Tom, that whole team on the Bondio side, and, and we had high probability are here to help. Hopefully this is helpful. And if, we, if, we, if you have any questions for us, we'll have our contact information included. So please let us know. We'd, we'd love to work with you. And uh, so with that, I think we'll end today's session. And just stay safe, everyone, and hopefully we will see you soon.